Okay, Monsignor, I think it's about 12.02. Uh, why don't we begin? It's a great privilege to pray this morning with all of us to pray in special fashion for our nation and these challenging times in which we live. Let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, when the Holy Spirit descended upon Jesus at his baptism in the Jordan, as he was praying, you revealed him as your only beloved son in whom you are well pleased. As we celebrate today this feast of the baptism of the Lord, this last day of the Christmas season, 2021, keep us your children born of water and the spirit, faithful to our calling, especially our call to holiness, a call that we received on the day of our baptisms. We ask this today at this John Carroll Society virtual gathering in gratitude and in thanksgiving through our Lord Jesus Christ, your son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you, Monsignor Vaghi, and thanks to each of you for joining us uh, today. We're privileged to have with us President Jack DeJoya, who together with his colleagues and students at Georgetown University have been brave and expert navigators of change through this COVID-19 pandemic. Our daughter is a student at Georgetown and I've just been so impressed with the administration, the faculty, and frankly, the students as they work very hard to thrive uh, during this past year. This webinar, as Monsignor noted, is sponsored by the John Carroll Society of the Archdiocese of Washington. I remember in 2009, when our family moved to Washington for the third time, how joining the John Carroll Society helped in making us feel at home in this town. There are seemingly endless opportunities with the John Carroll Society to grow in faith, make lifelong friends, share gifts, pursue justice, and to reach out to serve and be one with those on the margins. The strength and longevity of the John Carroll Society continues for 70 years and counting because its hopes and dreams uh, remain focused on people. So thanks again for joining us today. I hope to see many of you uh, in person in the coming months. And with that, I'm pleased to introduce David Florenzo, co-chair of today's event. David? Thank you, Jeff. We have a lot of John Carroll Society members on the call today. We also have lots of folks who are not members. Uh, we encourage all of you to apply for membership in the John Carroll Society today. The John Carroll Society holds a number of wonderful events like today's lecture throughout the year. And we've been able to continue many of them virtually through the pandemic. The society is a group of Catholic professionals and businessmen and women throughout the Washington area who want to grow spiritually, intellectually, and socially through lectures, social events, and charitable events, all to become closer to Christ. Highlights of each year include the Red Mass for our legal professionals, the Rose Mass for our healthcare professionals, our annual dinner in the spring, a series of talks monthly by our chaplain, Monsignor Peter Vaghi, Advent and Lenten retreats, and pilgrimage and many service opportunities. In fact, our, our next event coming up is our is a retreat in February, our virtual day of recollection on February 27th. Uh, our director will be Father Chris Seath, who is the director of spiritual formation at the St. John Paul II Seminary. I encourage everybody to attend. To enjoy these many events, we invite you to become a member today. And there are several ways to do it today. You could Take a photograph of a QR code uh, with your mobile phones that's shown up on the screen right now. Um, or you could go to our website, www.johncarrollsociety.org backslash membership, and you can apply there. All of you also received an email for today's lecture from Colleen Mudlap. You could simply reply to that email and tell Colleen that you're in in joining the John Carroll Society. Now, I need to let you know that you do have to have a sponsor on your application. Fortunately, our speaker today, President 
to Joy of Georgetown is a long-standing John Carroll Society member and is the Society's historian. He has agreed to sponsor any membership applications that come in today. So we've got that problem taken care of. I really invite you, come join us, particularly if you are new to this area, become a part of our group where you'll find other people who are also interested in growing closer to Jesus and enriching our Catholic faith. We welcome all of you. Now I'd like to turn things over to my co-chair, Christine Dunmer, who will introduce this morning's speaker. Thanks, David. Good afternoon, everyone. We're so very honored to have John J. DeJoya, the president of Georgetown University with us today to speak on the topic of higher education in a post-pandemic world. DeJoya is a graduate of Georgetown himself, holding a bachelor's degree in English and doctorate in philosophy. He served as a faculty member and senior administrator before being named the president of the Jesuit-led institution in 2001. He continues to teach an Ignatius seminar each fall for first year students focused on the Jesuit educational theme, Ora Personalis, Latin for care for the whole person. He's a respected thought leader in higher education, having served as chair of the board of American Council on Education, ACE, and as board chair of the Forum for the Future of Higher Education. He's a past recipient of the John Carroll Society Medal but of course, President DeJoya is no stranger to the society. He's a longtime member and friend of the society. And as David mentioned, he serves as the society's historian. So without further ado, please welcome President DeJoya. Thank you very much, Christine. And it's a privilege to be with all of you uh, this afternoon. And Jeff, thank you for your leadership and for this opportunity to gather together as members of the John Carroll Society. And I'd also like to thank Colleen and Monsignor Vaghi and David, and again, uh, Christine, for their support of today's program. As Chris, Christine mentioned, I've been asked to offer reflections on higher education and its place in a post-pandemic world. And just days ago, we faced a violent attack on the US Capitol, a, rep, a reprehensible attempt to undermine our democratic process and the work of our Congress. There are important and necessary steps we must take as a nation to grapple with the seriousness of this attack. And at the same time, we also must not lose sight of the devastating impact of the pandemic in our communities. Every day we are reaching a new and terrible milestone in terms of hospitalizations, the numbers of Americans who are dying of this disease. We've been dealing with this pandemic for nearly a year impacting every aspect of our daily lives. And we are all looking to respond in the best ways that we are capable of. It's hard to articulate all that we've experienced as a nation over this past year, especially these past few days of the new year. And for our young people forced to navigate this moment at a formative time in their lives, this has been an especially difficult moment. So in my comments today, I'd like to focus on what we've learned over this past year, where we go from here. As someone who has spent my life within higher education, now more than four decades at Georgetown. So first I'd like to focus on the pandemic and what we've learned. Um, the pandemic is having two impacts. First, it is exposing persistent challenges and fault lines that have been in place for the past few decades. And second, it's accelerating change for our institutions. I'd like to explore both of these aspects, but I wish to highlight one set of persistent challenges that have been so clearly presented throughout this past year. And those are the challenges of racial justice. The pandemic has revealed ever more deeply racial injustice in our nation. We have long known many of the dimensions of racial injustice. We've known that the black and white wealth gap has not changed in generations. The typical white family has eight times the wealth of the typical black family. We have known that 
Black children are more than twice as likely to attend high poverty schools and schools with lower resources. My colleagues here at Georgetown have studied and reported on health disparities right here in the District of Columbia, that white men will on average live 15 years longer than black men. In this pandemic, the mortality rate from COVID-19 for black Americans is two and a half to three and a half percent higher than for white Americans. Higher education has been one sector of our society that has played a role in trying to address the persistent gaps, the markers of racial injustice. The importance of our work has never been more important. Now, let me give you a picture of the current state of our higher education institutions. Now, more than 16 million students are enrolled in undergraduate post-secondary education across the United States. There are nearly 20 million enro enrolled overall, but roughly 16 million are undergraduates, a little over 3 million are, are graduate students or professional students. In 2010, we hit peak enrollment and we have been declining over the years since. This year, we saw more than a 3% drop for our undergraduates. And that translates to about a half a million fewer students who were enrolled this fall. And the trends are accelerating. For our first year students across the nation, there was a 13% drop. Now the drop in enrollment for first time international students was even greater. It was at 43%. And there are a number of factors that have contributed to this decline. I think the most significant is the pandemic. Now, these current trends anticipate our country's changing demographics. The number of college age young people will slowly rise over the next five years before hitting a peak in 2025 and then we're going to see a drop in the number of 18 year olds. Now embedded in, in this, this range of numbers that I've just provided you is a real paradox. Because while we see declining numbers of post-secondary students, never has a two or four year degree been more important. Now what leads me to say this? At its core is the demand of our increasingly knowledge-based global connected society, what is required to navigate the complexity of contemporary society is more nuanced, more sophisticated, wide ranging, and at the same time requires a capacity to go ever deeper in our engagement with new ideas. Now, based on the research of my colleagues here at our center, for education in the workforce, I'd like you to consider just the following. Two thirds of all new jobs require post-secondary education. By 2025, we estimate there will be 11 million unfilled jobs that require post-secondary education. We will need more college graduates to fulfill the demands of our economy right at the moment when we see declines. Let me give you just one striking example. By the way, higher ed has underperformed the economy, meaning we produce fewer graduates than the economy needs college graduates since 1983. So this is not a new phenomenon, but let me just give you one striking example. Tony Carnevale and his colleagues at our Center for Education in the Workforce found that in the recovery following the Great Recession, this would be between January 2010, January 2016, there were 11.6 million jobs created in America. Of these 11.6 million jobs, 80,000 of those jobs went to high school graduates. 
Now for context, the percentage of Americans with a four-year degree is about 32%. 8% have a two-year degree. There was no recovery following the Great Recession for those without higher education. And now the pandemic. And we have seen these very same trends play out over these past few months as those adults without a college education were much more likely to face unemployment related to the pandemic than those who had secured a college degree. Now these statistics I've shared with you are a proxy for the idea that in order to succeed in modern society, higher education is ever more vital, but there is more. We can never forget that the vision that shaped the place of colleges and universities in our nation since our founding, one that only deepened with the great expansion beginning in the middle of the last century, and that is to prepare a citizenry for a democracy. An educated citizenry is essential to our democracy. And we must remember this and commit to our young people. Now, let me talk for a moment about the underlying operating fundamentals for colleges and universities. Private colleges and universities represent about 20% of higher education. Among these include all of our more than 200 Catholic colleges and universities. Among private colleges and universities in the United States, the underlying fundamentals are not strong. One indicator, they have an average tuition discount rate greater than 50%. What this means is that for every dollar of tuition a school receives, they're returning 50% or more back to students in the form of financial aid with the hope that this will enable a school to meet enrollment targets. At our public institutions, we have seen systematic disinvestment over the past roughly 45 years, beginning in the mid-1970s. In 1975, states contributed 60% of public post-secondary spending. By the beginning of the last decade, it declined to 34%. And among some of our greatest public institutions, the decline has been even greater. For example, UC Berkeley receives less than 14% of its budget from the state. UT Austin, 11. UVA gets 8% of its budget from the state of Virginia. University of Michigan is at 8%. The University of Colorado at Boulder is 4%. And now this year, Colleges and universities are facing an estimated $120 billion in lost revenue and new costs associated with COVID-19. So that's, a, that's the background. How should we respond? Well, I think there are two, two steps that we, we, we need to take. The first step, immediate, we must, we must do everything we can to ensure that we are the strongest stewards of the resources for which we are responsible. Now, I wanna provide a little bit more background about those dynamics I was describing a moment ago, particularly facing our public institutions. Beginning in the 1980s, higher education began to be regarded as a private good best managed within the logic of the market. Now, this was a significant departure for most of the 20th century as we were building the greatest system of higher education in the world. We regarded higher education, both public and private, but we regarded higher education as what we would call a public good, a shared responsibility of one generation to the next generation. Higher education has been driven by a very different logic over the past 40 years, a market logic, higher education regarded as a private good. And it's no coincidence that we would see all of the challenges that have emerged 
ranging from rising costs to increased debt. It is imperative that we restore the idea of education as a public good. Public goods are a manifestation of our commitment to the common good. Martin Wolf of the Financial Times has a beautiful description of public goods. He describes public goods in the following way. Public goods are the building blocks of civilization. The history of civilization is a history of public goods. The more complex the civilization, the greater the number of public goods that need to be provided. Ours is far and away the most complex civilization humanity has ever developed. So it's need for public goods and goods with public good aspects, such as education and health, is extraordinarily large." Close quote. Now, when we think about the challenges we face, some of which I've just outlined, all of which have been exacerbated by the pandemic, this is our central focus. How can we restore a shared commitment to public goods, all of which contribute to the common good, and what role must our educational institutions play in this work? And there is a second step. We have to strive for greater integrity and fidelity to our traditional mission and purpose. We need to recommit ourselves to the three characteristic elements that constitute the very idea of the university, formation, inquiry, and common good. There are three characteristic elements that constitute the university. We support the formation of our young people, the inquiry, the scholarship and research of our faculty, and we contribute to the common good of the communities in which we participate. These three elements are mutually reinforcing, inextricably linked, and cannot be unbundled without risking irreparable harm to the enterprise. So a word about each. Formation can occur in many different settings. This work of formation is distinguished in the context of a university by our commitment to knowledge. We introduce students to disciplines and methodologies for engaging in the work of knowing. We introduce students to approaches to knowing, to different perspectives, different bodies of knowledge. Most important, we help our students understand how to integrate, appropriate, challenge, and critique the knowledge we teach them, how to see patterns, make connections, identify anomalies. Immersion in academic life, learning the methods and studying the current state of knowledge, both in a core set of disciplines and in an area of concentrated focus, provides an unparalleled foundation for the work of personal formation. These experiences enable young people to come to terms with the fundamental question of personal formation, what constitutes an authentic life. Each student wrestles with the question of authenticity, a question whose contours are not evident. The work of personal formation is to secure an interior freedom so that students can achieve a profound degree of authenticity while they are forming their general education. Inquiry. Our faculty embody this commitment to knowledge by their commitment to this second characteristic of the university, to inquiry, to the pursuit of truth. They seek to understand at deeper and deeper levels aspects of ourselves, of one another, and of our world. And they share this experience with our students. And we have a unique role to play in society. We are committed to the pursuit of truth. All the other elements of our mission are not possible without this commitment. And truth is established through what we would call epistemic communities, communities grounded in distinctive approaches 
to knowledge. When you hear the words epistemic community, think disciplines and departments. The work of these communities led by our faculty is to produce true knowledge. Knowledge is the product of institutionally sanctioned and cultivated practice. And our faculty devote their lives to this work so that all of us may benefit from a greater understanding of our world. Stefan Kalini, a colleague at Cambridge, captures the nature of inquiry that we sustain in the academy, what he describes as, quote, the ungovernable play of the inquiring mind, close quote. By ungovernable, he means there's no predicting where thought and analysis may lead when allowed to play freely. Faculty must be provided space for the untrammeled quest for understanding. The third dimension of our mission is our public role, the responsibility that we have to the common good. I offered some reflections just a moment ago when I described our commitment to public goods. And there is much more. There is the work that we contribute to civic engagement and to developing citizens to preparing a workforce and sustaining a regional economy, to addressing social inequities and contributing social capital. Every university is expected to engage with the unique resources of our institutions in contributing to the common good. How we do this is shaped by our individual context. These expectations of a university in its public role broadly include preparing a workforce, developing the regional economy, strengthening national identity, enhancing economic competitiveness, both locally and globally, balancing and ameliorating social inequities, developing citizens, contributing social capital. And moreover, the public role for a particular university is often determined by a local set of issues. For example, for a public land grant university, the responsibilities for the economic development of a state may comprise a strong commitment to agricultural research. And for urban universities, an emphasis may be placed on educating first generation college attendees. Regardless of the setting, the public role is intrinsic to the total mission of the university and it is bound to the work of formation and inquiry. Now, a special word about Catholic colleges and universities. Because while we share this responsibility to the common good with all colleges and universities, I wish to close by offering a brief reflection on the responsibilities of Catholic universities. And I will do so from my experience within one Catholic University. The last sentence of the mission statement of the Jesuits, the formula for the Institute written by St. Ignatius himself ends with these words. Moreover, he should show himself ready to reconcile the estranged, compassionately assist and serve those who are in prisons or hospitals, and indeed, to perform any other works of charity according to what will seem expedient for the glory of God and the common good. Now, Father John O'Malley spent the last 15 years of his more than 60 years of teaching and scholarship here at Georgetown. And John retired this past May. John identifies Cicero's De Officius, as a foundational influence on Ignatius and the first Jesuits. And Cicero was a favorite author. The early Jesuits knew his work by heart. De Officius is often translated as on public responsibility. Father O'Malley identifies this passage, which I'll, which I'll share with you, this passage of Cicero as having foundational resonance within our tradition. This is Cicero. We are not born for ourselves alone. We too as human beings are born for the sake 
of other human beings that we might be able mutually to help one another. We ought therefore to contribute to the common good of humankind by reciprocal acts of kindness, by giving and receiving from one another, and thus by our skill, our industry, and our talents, work to bring human society together in peace and harmony. Father O'Malley calls this the foundation of a civic spirituality. In this tradition upon which our university is built, we acknowledge that we have a civic commitment to seek the common good. In this moment in our nation, in this moment for our nation's colleges and universities, I believe it's urgent that we recognize this enduring responsibility. So it's an honor for me to be with you. I'm deeply grateful for this opportunity. I look forward to our conversation and what will follow. Thank you very much for listening. And thank you, President DeJoya. That was really a terrific uh, presentation. We do have a few questions. Uh, Raj, do you wanna bring those folks in? Yes, thanks, Jeff. I actually have the, uh, the first question for you and thanks so much, President DeJoya, for your remarks. Our first question for you is a, a two-part question. Higher education has evolved out of necessity during this pandemic. Which of the changes are most likely to stick post-pandemic and which are you most anxious to leave behind? And have you identified any blessings or consolations for faculty or students emerging from this pandemic? Oh, thanks very much, Raj. Well, um, let me think. Uh, I've never been prouder to be a member of our Georgetown community. These days have been extraordinarily challenging. We're entering our 11th month. Um, tomorrow will be the first day since we announced we would be fully virtual, uh, March 11th. I have seen a community come together in ways that have been so moving and so inspiring. Just to give you a sense, 1900 members of our faculty participated voluntarily uh, in workshops and training with a, a center we have here on campus called CANDLES. It's an acronym for a, the Center for New Designs and Learning and Scholarship. We established it nearly two decades ago. It's a unique center really at the forefront in innovation in teaching and pedagogy. And I remember meeting with the founder of CANDLES and the leader of CANDLES uh, on, on March 13th, just saying, you know, we, were, we built this thing for this moment. And Candles has enabled our faculty to develop a whole new set of skills that I do think will be coming forward. I think we will bring forward some of our online experiences. I'll just give you one example for me in, in my fall seminar, I scheduled one-on-one -on -one sessions each week with a group of students on rotating basis so that I would, you know, roughly every three to four weeks, I would see everybody in one-on-one -on -one sessions that would go for a, a, about a half an hour each on Saturday mornings. Oh, I've never had such powerful experiences in what would normally be called office hours. And I, have a, I think I'm gonna try to keep some of that as, as I go forward. I think faculty have been able to implement new, new pedagogies, create new kinds of assignments that take advantage of the digital, digital format. We've talked for two decades about the flipped classroom. And now I think we, we all have a great deal of experience with the idea of putting materials available prior to class for students to immerse themselves in with greater emphasis in the classroom setting on discussion. I think we've also been able to connect more people for, for events and, and dialogues. We, you know, we've, we've, we've had, you know, uh, as many as 100,000 people join us for some of our online events. I also think one, one, one positive experience for our students in our virtual environment is they've been able to share some of their academic experience with their families who get to see firsthand the academic, academic experience taking place. I'd also say we've also realized, I don't think we ever took it for granted, but we know how, how 
just of incalculable worth the on-campus experience is, how much it means to all of us. And we can't wait to get everybody back here and to get back into our residential, our residential experience. Thank you, Jack. And great question, Roz. Uh, yes, I, I enjoy walking around the Georgetown campus myself and I missed that over the past year or so. We have a few more questions. Um, let's hear the next one, please. I think it's me. Hi, I'm Mary Mae Pinnell. I am a Georgetown alum and I am also an incoming parent. My daughter will be a freshman next year. So hence my very specific question to you. How has Ignatian spirituality helped your students navigate the pandemic? Everything from finding the magus in difficult situations to presupposing the best motives of colleagues under stress to remaining grateful as a mechanism for change. Have you seen the Jesuit spirit help your students become brave and expert navigators of change? Oh, it's a wonderful question, Mary Mary. We're, we're welcome back, uh, welcome aboard. It'll be wonderful to welcome you to campus in, in yeah. August. Um, you know, as I reflect on, I think the most important of the characteristics of the Jesuit tradition that has been so invaluable for us over these last months is, is captured in the Latin words, cura personalis. Uh, this Latin phrase translates as care of the person. It was originally used to describe the responsibility of the Jesuit superior to care for each man in the community with his unique gifts, challenges, needs, possibilities. And today this value applies broadly to our shared university life, to include the relationship between our faculty and our students, the, pro the professional relationship among all those who work in the universities. And Cure Personalis is, it's a profound care and responsibility for one another grounded in individualized attention to the needs of the other, attentive to their unique circumstances and concerns, their particular gifts and limitations. It's, it's, it's an effort to encourage each person's flourishing and care for the person in the vision of St. Ignatius recognizes that every one of us needs cura. We need the help of others, of our companions, of those around us, those who share our journeys with us. And, and every one of us has a responsibility for cura, for the care of those around us. And I think that, I, I, I think Father, Father Peter Hans Kolvenbach, the, the Superior General for a quarter century of the Jesuits, until 2007, but he once said that, you know, it, it goes without saying that each, each one of us needs cure personalis. No one can manage on her or his own. And each of us has a responsibility to provide cure personalis. Now we, we have, our, our team has worked so hard under the leadership of our, of our Vice President for Mission and Ministry, Mark Bosco, and all of our colleagues in campus ministry, as well as across student affairs and our programs in, 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 in social justice and, and, and our Center for Minority Educational Affairs and our Counseling Center. And Mark Bosco and our colleagues in, in Mission and Ministry have sustained what, what, what they have called spiritual continuity, including aspects of our retreat program. Some of you may know that a few years ago, we built a new retreat center in the Shenandoahs. Every weekend during the semester, about 80 undergraduates are away on retreat. And we've been able to sustain some aspects of this virtually. Our, our popular first year retreat called Escape, which we've been doing for 30 years, was done virtually this fall. And then like many parishes, we've offered mass virtually every Sunday since March. During the Tritium in April, we had more than 100,000 join us for Holy Thursday, Good Friday, Easter Sunday mass. 
I think the, the witness that we're able to provide for one another through the broad range of our mission and ministry programs um, and, and the ways in which we've tried to ensure the vital spirit is, is present here in our community, even virtually, um, has enabled us, I think, to, to respond that much better in this moment. Thank you, President DeJoya, and great question, uh, Mayor May. Um, I want to thank Raj and Colleen who are managing this. I see our next question is coming from Amanda Alexander. Uh, Raj, can you bring her in? Dr. DeJoya, thanks so much for your talk. I, um, I think I speak for everyone in that I feel optimistic about the future post-pandemic. Uh, uh, I have a two-part question, and it's what initiatives are emerging in Catholic higher education to maintain strength and relevance in our ever-changing world? And uh, as a follow-up to that, uh, what's on the horizon for Catholic higher ed that we may not have heard about yet? Sure, sure. These, these are great questions. Thank you. Um, you know, for some years now, I have served on the higher ed working group of the USCCB. It's chaired by Bishop John Quinn of uh, the Diocese of Winona, Rochester. And uh, in that context, I also would say within the context of the Association of Catholic Colleges and Universities and the Association of Jesuit Colleges and Universities, and we have exceptional leadership of both of these organizations, Father Dennis Holschneider, long serving president of DePaul, Father Michael Garanzini, of, a uh, long-serving president of Loyola University Chicago. We, we brought to Washington two, two Chicago folks to run ACCU and AJCU, and they are providing brilliant leadership of their organizations. And in that context, I think you're going to see a similar dynamic to what I presented earlier in my remarks, which is a, a focus on core fundamentals. Many of our places, are facing serious challenges, especially to the basic economic model. A number of our places are, are, are really facing some, some, some real challenges in being able to sustain the core economic model. And then we're, all of us are looking for ever more creative ways to respond to our responsibilities for formation, inquiry, common good. Now that's, that's a vocabulary that, that I'm very comfortable with others may use different, different words, but I think you'd find a real commonality to our understanding of our responsibilities. We have responsibilities to our students to ensure that, that we provide them the very best context to do work that best takes place during these undergraduate years. We, we, we have responsibilities for our faculty to ensure that they can do their very best work and, and explore the, the domain of knowledge that, that they've prepared themselves for. And then in every one of our settings, our communities look to us as anchor institutions to really provide the, the foundation. In the Jesuit context, I, I would say that um, after an incredibly engaging process of communal discernment, that included a, a meeting of all leaders in Jesuit higher education worldwide that was held two summers ago in Bilbao and in Loyola in Spain. The Superior General of the Jesuits came, you know, presented four universal apostolic priorities that each of us as individuals, each institution in the Jesuit context is asked to engage. And those, those four priorities are ones that these are questions that we're living with every day. The, let me share with you know, just briefly what they are. The first is showing the way to God through a, a focus on Ignatian spirituality. We recognize in a diverse community like we have here at Georgetown, showing the way to God through our, our very rich interreligious campus ministry program. There is nothing quite like the campus ministry program at Georgetown. We've had a full-time rabbi since the, the late 1960s, we were the first American university with a full-time imam, a full-time uh, uh, Hindu uh, a priest. We've, we've got this extraordinary rich basis on which 
to engage these questions and to model them for our students and our faculty and staff. We bring to it uh, the richness of Ignatian spirituality and we hope we, we can honor this universal apostolic priority. The second is to walk with the poor, the outcasts of the world, those whose dignity has been violated, um, to do so in a mission of reconciliation and justice. We were asked third to accompany the young in the creation of a hope-filled world. And then finally, really in response to Pope Francis's encyclical, Laudato Si, that we accept as a responsibility caring for our common home. And, and I think, I, I think those, those dynamics are, bringing, are, are, are trying to bring out of us the new creative, imaginative ways in which we can live most faithfully with the, with the deepest fidelity and integrity to our mission and identity as, as, as Catholic and, and for us, Jesuit institutions. Thank you, President DeJoya, and thank you, Amanda, for that terrific question. Um, let me thank again Raj Narona, who has been our technical uh, leader today, along with Colleen Mudloff. Let me thank David Florenzo and, and Christine Dunn Mayer for their great leadership of today's event. Uh, our chaplain, Monsignor Vaghi, for his leadership of the society. And of course, President Jack DeJoya for his uh, great leadership and willingness to share his thoughts with us today. With that, I think we're ready for final prayer, uh, Monsignor Peter Vaghi. Thank you very much, Jeff. And Jack, thank you very much for those inspiring, hope-filled words to uh, in your talk that you gave us today and for being here. And all of you who have joined virtually this program, we have over 170 people who've joined, which is an all-time great for uh, a January brunch. We end, as I mentioned, the Christmas season in this COVID year today on this Feast of the Baptism of the Lord. But there's no way we can forget when we think of the baptism of Jesus, the birth of Jesus, his blessed mother. So I'd like to conclude with the memorari, and, and you can pray with me with this, uh, that beautiful prayer to our blessed lady, to ask her in a way to protect our country, to protect all of us and our health, to be with those in need at this hour, particularly those who are suffering from this virus. So let us pray. Remember, O most gracious Virgin Mary, that never was it known, that anyone who fled to thy protection, implored thy help and sought thy intercession was left unaided. Inspired by this confidence, I fly unto thee, O Virgin of virgins, my mother. To thee I come, before thee I stand, sinful and sorrowful, O mother of the word incarnate. Despise not my petitions, but in thy mercy, hear and answer me, amen. And may the blessing of Almighty God descend upon each and every one of us and our families in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. We go forth now in joy and peace and gratitude for our fellowship of the John Carroll Society. Amen. Thank you, Monsignor. God bless you. And thank you again, President DeJoya. God bless you all. Have a wonderful Sunday. And I hope to see each of you again soon.